Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Baker. I'm a partner at Chartwell Law, and we would like to thank you for joining today's presentation regarding post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental claims related to workers' compensation arising from COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, we have a, a distinguished panel with us today. Uh, I'd first like to thank uh, Evo National and Dr. Uh, Douglas Craig for his willingness to participate. Uh, also uh, on the panel today is Steve Tregay and Tom Gallagher, both of Chartwell. Uh, I'm going to ask each to introduce themselves and, and uh, give a brief background of, of their experience and, and what they uh, might bring to the table today. Uh, uh, just a housekeeping matter, if you have questions, uh, you're encouraged to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen rather than the chat function. Uh, I think the group, the panel, we would all uh, uh, encourage questions, encourage discussion to the extent that we can do so virtually. Uh, rather than uh, you all listening to us talk for an hour uh, without any interaction. Uh, but with that being said, uh, Dr. Craig, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, so good, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Doug Craig, and I am the president and lead forensic and police psychologist with Atlantic OcuPsych. My area of expertise is in uh, forensic psychological assessment. I conduct a relatively large volume of independent medical exams annually. Um, as well as uh, work with uh, first responders as one of my main areas of, ex of expertise. And it's a pleasure being here to answer any questions and to talk about this very important topic. Uh, next, I'd like to, you know, Steve Tregay to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name's Steve Tregay. I've been practicing exclusively workers' compensation for, I believe, 24 years in a row at this point. Uh, I am licensed to practice in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and DC. And uh, I'm also a partner at Chartwell. But prior to my Chartwell experience, I did spend uh, an extended amount of time working with claimants. So I think I do believe I, I bring a different perspective sometimes to the defense bar, where I can see where if I was handling the claim as a claimant's counsel, what would I do versus what would I be doing as a defense counsel? I think it helps uh, to be able to analyze cases that way. And Mr. Gallagher? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Gallagher, uh, also a partner at Chartwell. Uh, I am out of the Harrisburg office. Um, I'm barred in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, but pretty much handle mostly uh, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and uh, as far as um, uh, my experience, it is not uh, quite 24 years, but I do have a, a lot of experience with workers' compensation. Um, and I don't know what else I've I'm about to have two kids under two, so pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, my name is Rob Baker. Uh, I am a, a partner at Chartwell. Um, my practice focuses on workers' compensation and employment-related matters. Uh, and uh, today I'll serve as really the, the moderator for the distinguished panel. Uh, I, I think first we're going to start, <clears throat> excuse me, with the different standards uh, uh, required for uh, mental claims in Pennsylvania, Maryland and Washington, DC. And then we have four different fact patterns that we're going to review first with the doctor and his, uh, his uh, expertise is what he's seen relative to the claims uh, in today's environments. And then we'll briefly go through uh, the more boring part, which is the legal analysis of, of uh, whether under our fact patterns, uh, the claims uh, may be uh, satisfied for compensability. Uh, but Tom, I think we'll start with you. If you don't mind, could you uh, summarize briefly the, the different types of, of claims that you might see as it relates to PTSD, anxiety, depression, uh, things along those lines uh, in Pennsylvania workers' compensation? Sure. Um, so in Pennsylvania, um, I know most people know as far as physical injuries and the ramifications for that, but for mental um, or psycho uh, psychological uh, injuries <clears throat> or issues, there are three standards under PA law. Um, they each carry their own burden of proof. Um, the three standards are, they call it the physical mental case. Um, this involves a mental condition that occurs um, during or after a physical event. Um, a mental physical injury case, that involves a mental condition that um, manifests itself in a physical way and then last but not least, <clears throat> the mental mental case. Uh, this is purely psychological trauma and it's based on a, a psychological stimuli. Um, and this is the highest burden case. So 
Um, for the physical mental standard, uh, we'll start with that first. This is the, the lowest burden for the injured worker um, under Pennsylvania. Um, it's important to note that the work-related physical injury that first occurs does not actually have to result in any disability to the claimant. What does that mean? The, the physical injury itself does not necessarily have to uh, result in any wage loss um, for the injured worker. Um, that being said, the worker only needs to prove that the physical stimulus resulted in some type of psychological condition, such as uh, PTSD, uh, stress, depression, something like that. The doctor will get into, you know, exactly what those conditions are. Um, uh, assuming the injured worker is able to meet that initial threshold, he or she would then be required to prove that the physical injury caused the mental condition. And you have to prove that by unequivocal medical evidence. Um, at that point, the worker would need to establish, establish um, that they actually have some type of mental uh, diagnosable condition. And it's specifically uh, related to them having sustained some type of uh, physical injury to start with. Um, the second case or standard would be the mental, mental physical standard. Um, this is when a physical injury arises from uh, psychological stimulus, um, mostly something like stress. Um, the worker needs to establish that the work-related psychological stimulus uh, caused the resulting physical injury. Uh, the type of injuries or, or these type of cases have two common elements. Um, they either arise out of a, a, a psychological stimulus that causes the um, physical injury, which continues even after the stimulus is removed, um, and the disability or loss of earning um, that results, which is actually caused by uh, the physical condition rather than by the uh, psychological stimulus. Um, it's important to note that in the context of COVID-19, um, the worker will be required to first establish that a psychological stimulus specifically exists as a direct result of COVID-19. Um, the last standard, this is the mental mental standard. Um, this is easily the, the highest burden standard um, for these ty type of uh, uh, cases for the injured worker. Um, there are two scenarios where this standard would apply. The first would be where a claimant seeks to prove that a single psychological trauma or stressful working environment resulted in a, a mental condition. Um, you would typically see this or, or we typically see this in situations where someone is held at gunpoint um, or, or something of that nature. Um, the individual would then need to prove that either the extraordinary uh, events occurred at work which caused the trauma um, and they could be uh, pinpointed in time or the more likely scenario what we see uh, more often is abnormal working conditions. These can occur over a long period of time, um, but they also ultimately have to uh, cause some type of psychological distress or injury. Um, the courts have explained that the injured workers must prove that the work-related stress must be caused by actual objective um, abnormal working conditions as opposed to you know, something that uh, an in injured worker subjectively perceives that may not actually rise to the level of abnormal working conditions. Um, and it's important to note, which we'll, we'll get into when we discuss the fact pattern, that um, it's really a, a, a fact-sensitive case-by-case analysis um, to determine whether or not there are abnormal uh, working conditions. Um, so that's it for the three scenarios. Um, it's kind of broad strokes for um, three uh, scenarios under Pennsylvania law. So uh, Tom, before we continue with Steve, I, I guess it might go without saying, but uh, can you just clarify whether or not these standards uh, rem eliminate the, the underlying burdens that an employee or a claimant has to meet with respect to establishing a claim petition? In other words, you know, do the burdens of uh, an injury within the course and scope of employment or you know, on the property or in furtherance of the, of the uh, employer's business affairs. Uh, can you explain how, how those burdens might need to be met versus not met under these psychological components? Right, so um, that's a great question. Um, they do, so as far as actual, um, the, the typical claim petition, um, you still need to show that obviously it's, it's within the, the course and scope of employment. 
um, and that it's related um, to the actual uh, work uh, first. So there's, there's an initial burden before actually meeting um, whether or not these um, additional burdens must be met as well uh, for each scenario. Thank you. So Steve, uh, can you explain a, a little bit about Maryland law as it relates to these types of, of uh, mental claims or you're, you're smiling or perhaps the, the, the lack of, of guidance uh, yeah. from the state? Uh, excellent. That's very good, Rob. <laughs> you, that's like that, you almost took the words out of my mouth. Maryland deals with the physical, sort of the same sort of setup. They talk about physical mental claims. That's if I'm helping Rob move his desk at work and I blow out you know, three, three discs. And as a result, I have a surgery. As a result of the surgery, I get intractable pain. As a result of that pain, I get depression. That's related you know, under the Maryland standard. And it's the same thing. You would still have to, I'd have to prove that the original injury was in the course and scope and arising out of my employment. I think we should assume, let's just assume for a second, I proved that. And I get depression as a result of that, that would be considered work-related. The question regarding a mental mental case, I did a little bit of a deep dive in the case law. And the problem with Maryland is there isn't a lot of case law. And you might ask, Steve, why is that the case? Uh, because in Maryland, if you take a, a case to the commission and you decide you don't like the result and you file an appeal, that appeal goes to circuit court and you have a full-blown jury trial. So the question whenever you file an appeal is going to be, is it worth spending ten dollars or $15,000 on appeal to have a two-day jury trial on this issue? And many times it's not. So there are not a lot of cases out there regarding mental mental cases. Uh, the seminal case is an interesting case. It's the Delker case. There was a woman who was working for T. Rowe Price, just minding her business, sitting at her desk when a three ton beam fell through the ceiling and it landed about five feet from her desk. She suffered no physical injury, but as a result of the occurrence, she ended up with sleep disturbance, nightmares, heart palpitations, and headaches. That case went up on appeal and the appellate court said, well, there's nothing specifically in the act that says these just mental cases would be compensable. Well, we think they would be, but we're not going to make a decision on what the test is. So we don't know what the test is. We're just going to go ahead and remand that. And guess what? We never got it. We never, we got it, never got a result. So we, do, I don't know how that case turned out, but I will tell you as a rule of thumb in Maryland on a mental mental case, I would deny it. And we would, we would have to take that. Uh, to, uh, I would take it to the commission. I wouldn't just, I would never roll over on a mental mental case in Maryland. Yeah, I, and I think the, the same general guidance with respect to mental mental claims in Pennsylvania applies. Uh, you know, we, say, yeah. we, we typically uh, would, would uh, suggest denial and have the claimant uh, uh, argue their burden of proof. Uh, especially with the abnormal working condition. So Steve, quick question on, on the issue of the remand of the case. It sounds like that you didn't uh, receive further guidance on uh, on the standard from the courts because they probably settled the case on remand if I, I would had completely, to read between I would the lines. I agree with you, Rob. Yeah, that's correct. I, I believe it was probably settled. And it wasn't taken up on appeal again. So right now, I mean, I would say the standard is they are still going to need to prove uh, in, in Maryland, it's more objective. They would need to prove that there was some type of uh, objective mental condition that was caused by this mental occurrence, you know, as compared to that physical injury that causes the depression. Uh, are, are there any other standards that apply in Maryland, Steve, or should we shift to, to DC at this we point? Can shift, I mean, when it comes to a, a purely mental, mental, I mean, no. So I would say no. I mean, it's, I don't want to go, I don't want to bog us down with it's it's sort of the same standard. It has to rise out of the rise out of the employment. You have to be in the course of. So in the example where a person sitting at their desk doing their job and a, a beam falls through, I think they've met the arising out of and in the course of. Uh, so no, I, I think we could shift to DC at this point, which is a little different. Okay, so if, if you wouldn't mind, just you know, briefly tell us about the the standard in DC, yeah. and, and we'll you know dive into the more interesting part with the doctor. Not not at all. In in DC. There is a presumption, whether it's a mental case, uh, and again, they, they do make the distinction in DC, physical, mental, mental, mental. So the same thing, moving the desk, herniated discs, there's going to be a, but there's a presumption at every level that the claim is in fact work-related or that the mental, uh, the PTSD is in fact work-related. 
So in DC, you're going to have this burden. The claimant only has to show that more or less it's, it's possibly related, show a small amount of evidence. I do have PTSD and I'm saying it's related to the employment. The burden then shifts to the employer to show by substantial evidence that it is not related. It turns out uh, there were other factors uh, that caused the PTSD or the depression. Uh, the burden would then shift back to the claimant to say no uh, through a preponderance of the evidence uh, that it is in fact related. So that aside, when we're looking at mental claims in DC, we have to remember that there is this presumption and on a purely mental mental case, that it's up to the claimant to say, I am invoking that presumption uh, that it is work related. So I would say on any uh, mental mental case, uh, not necessarily that we deny it outright, but whether we get an IME as quickly as possible uh, to determine whether or not uh, it's work related if we have a, 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 uh, a medical basis to continue to defend the claim. So I, I think, uh, doctor, if you don't mind, before we start uh, our discussion of the, the four different fact patterns, uh, perhaps you could just tell the group you know, what it is that you've seen over the last 14 months as it relates to uh, PTSD, other mental uh, health claims arising from COVID, and, and how you generally have been uh, approaching those claims when you conduct, say, an IME. Well, it, it, it is a very interesting um, experience these past 14 months uh, on, on one hand. So I do see a relatively large volume of, of mental health uh, claims and uh, lots of PTSD claims. But uh, the COVID-19 particularly related claim seems to have dwindled over the past several months. Early on in March of 2020, April, May of 2020, I would see a lot of claims, uh, but they would pretty much turn out like this. And most of them coming from first responders, not medical professionals, but uh, you know, firefighters, paramedics, uh, police officers, corrections officers, those kinds of things. And, and there's a natural anxiety because back then we really didn't have a pure grasp of uh, really what COVID-19 um, and what, what the progression of symptoms were. It was just quite uh, anxiety provoking. But uh, when I would end up seeing a claimant who said I have PTSD as a result of a COVID-19 exposure, well, first, it's important to distinguish that trauma isn't PTSD. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder is a psychiatric diagnosis really defined by a plethora and diverse symptoms that have been going on for quite some time. So for example, one of the criterions is of course a trauma uh, and that trauma has to be impairing in some capacity and then it needs to, the, the impairment has to last for at least a month. And, and so pretty significant impairment in, in various domains, avoidant behaviors, emotional uh, experiences, uh, cognitive behavior, uh, cognitions, those kinds of things. But when I would see folks uh, for PTSD COVID related claims, I, I would ask them quite simple questions. Well, um, how do you know it's COVID? And, and oftentimes uh, back then uh, they would say, well, I don't know if it was COVID. I was just feeling a little bit under the weather and okay. Uh, well, then how, how has this impacted you? And say, well, it makes me anxious to go to work. And I say, well, are you going to work? And then oftentimes I would say, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm still at work. And I'd say, okay, so so then tell me how has this impacted you? And, and so there would be this low level of anxiety that I think uh, pretty much across the board everyone had because we didn't know how it was transmitted. We didn't, uh, there was a, a very heightened anxiety back in, in March of 2020, but uh, ultimately the, through questioning, what we reveal is, is that there was really, um, we could not pinpoint an exposure Oftentimes we could not pinpoint a diagnosis. And then oftentimes we could not pinpoint any impairment in work or social functioning. And then we, and so ultimately it was like, so why, why, why are we meeting? And, 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 and so it certainly wasn't post-traumatic stress disorder um, from the exposure. And then what I've noticed in, in a pattern over time was, is I would continue seeing a lot of the, the common referrals that, that, that I would see correctional officers exposed to uh, bodily fluids, uh, bus operators who have been assaulted, uh, police officers who've been involved in altercations, um, and, and uh, you know, COVID-19 kind of crept in as a, a potential variable. Uh, but uh, ultimately the treatment for any anxiety or trauma disorder, whether it's through COVID exposure, whether it's through a natural adjustment reaction, uh, so let's say from someone who was in a serious car accident really is the same. And I think that's really the key is uh, when someone has a trauma related or an anxiety and depression related disorder, the, the evidence-based intervention is cognitive and behavioral interventions. 
So if it's a trauma, it's natural to experience a certain anxiety reaction. And the evidence-based intervention isn't to put that person on meds, it's to expose them to trauma so they habituate to the, the amplified emotional reactions and then over repeated exposures, then the emotional reactions subside. And similarly with depression, you, you know, you want to keep that person engaged, keep that person at work and address their cognitions. Or put another way, if you can implement, uh, well, first, if you can distinguish between the legitimate and those that are simulated impairment. And there are a lot of folks out there that, uh, in fact, it's uh, among the experts, it's, it's for mental, mental claims. It's estimated to be about four, up to 40% of, of individuals are embellishing their, their maladjustment or simulated impairment and clinical terms called malingering. Um, so it's a very high, high rate of that. But if you can distinguish that and kind of get those that are malingering out of the question and you can substantiate that an individual has a legitimate mental health issue, well, the, the, the evidence-based interventions actually are getting back to work. And getting back to work and some, with some concurrent therapy the, is, is uh, almost always indicated. And in fact, we know the longer an individual is actually away from work, even if it relates from a COVID-19 exposure, well, then the, the more likely they're going to be vulnerable to perhaps even treatment-induced harm. Uh, or put another way, you know, I had a, a, a correctional officer I had seen recently who had uh, been basically told that he was exposed to bodily fluids and the therapist was saying, well, I don't think this job is for you. I don't think you should go back to work. And that was a big issue because going back to work and, and readjusting and habituating and addressing that anxiety of being exposed to bodily fluid, which ultimately is something that they're trained for and it's part of, uh, part of the job, unfortunately, uh, then th that person is less likely to go back to work, but ultimately the causality of the, the the factor impacting the impairment was no longer the exposure to the bodily fluid, it was actually the treatment. Or put another way, kind of in a long-winded way of saying this, is even COVID-19 related exposure or concerns, the treatment intervention is still the same for trauma and depressive related disorders. Getting back to work is, is really fundamental. I think you see that in, in all claims, right, doctor? It's not necessarily uh, claims involving a, a psychiatric component, but uh, the sooner we can get an, a, an injured worker uh, to return to gainful employment, I, I think the statistics have proven that, uh, that they're less likely to continue on any sort of workers' compensation. Uh, so even the modified duty programs are, are a great option. Absolutely. Uh, so so I, I think at this point, uh, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to start with the scenarios. So I'll review the first scenario. And then, doctor, I was hoping that maybe uh, you could point out some, uh, some areas that you might uh, uh, investigate or research from the medical perspective. And then we'll just kind of go around the, you know, the table, so to speak, with Tom and Steve applying their respective jurisdictions to the, to the fact pattern. So uh, the first fact pattern is as follows. A nurse experiences stress and anxiety resulting from an increased workload in daily interaction with COVID-19 related fatalities, but does not contract the virus. So I guess, doctor, to start with you, uh, based on that fact pattern, what would you identify as, as areas of concern or areas that would require further investigation? Well, for, first, I really wanna highlight a, a, a pretty substantial external variable that impacts adjustment and I think is a major um, uh, variable in terms of fueling workers' compensation claims. And that's uh, the concept of perceived injustice uh, when, when there is a claimant who feels unsupported by work, um, that actually makes them feel more like a number, if you will, and that ultimately ends up being a, a, a point why they want to continue a, in any kind of workers' compensation claims. So kind of as related to this particular fact is, is uh, I, I mean, the, the way that the employer is communicating support uh, for their employees is quite fundamental. You know, validating that you know this is quite difficult. We we uh, you know are overwhelmed with work. We we understand uh, that the impact that that could have. And so here are some things that we can do to provide support. It's kind of like um, you know providing free meals, uh, checking in on everyone, uh, you know, providing uh, other supportive resources. These proactively can can really continue to fuel the intrinsic reward that uh, first responders and really in the midst of, of the COVID uh, related issues, nurses, physicians, those uh, medical professionals uh, working in hospitals, things like that, it, it can mediate the intensity of the reaction. 
Uh, but just like any profession, we are all prone to burnout. And, and uh, burnout is very real uh, because we, we can only tolerate a, a, a certain amount. Uh, and and uh, once our psychological resources are depleted, well, then you, there, I mean, that, that's kind of all you got. And then that mediating variable, that external variable, it's not really the work, but it's, uh, you know, where you can have employer support really help out in, in terms of uh, fueling the, the, uh, the, the employee and, and, and keeping, uh, you, you know, at the job. Here, I, I mean, of course, uh, you know, the anxiety is related to, to the workload. And uh, it's kind of like we see this also in the correctional system where um, there's a lot of mandatory overtime and, uh, you, you know, burnout is a very real thing. So how do you address that? Um, it, it seems to me to, to be like an administrative issue. But again, the first and foremost too is, is getting an individual into an assessment. Oftentimes, clinicians forget that one of the first variables in conducting a therapeutic or forensic assessment is uh, you have to assess the validity of the symptoms. It says there right there in, in the beginning of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that you have to make sure that this is not a simulated impairment situation. So getting someone in for an IME, for example, and, and evaluating how is this person doing and then kind of providing recommendations if it is a legitimate burnout situation can help. You know, maybe the person can work a modified schedule. Maybe the person just works a regular schedule. Maybe the person just needs, uh, you know, to, to uh, have a day or two off if, if that's something possible. But ultimately what we see is, is the earlier we can react, the, the quicker we can implement uh, administrative support from the employer to kind of prevent the evolution of a, a perceived injustice. What happens is we don't see these kinds of claims evolving into long-term impairments. And in fact, what we see is, especially with the administrative action, is we see these individuals developing higher levels of morale and support, and they're more dedicated to, to their work as opposed to having long-term psychological impairments. Thank you, doctor. So, uh, Tom, I'll start with you uh, in, in the same order. Uh, can you tell me, first of all, what uh, burden of proof or standard would apply to this fact pattern in Pennsylvania? Sure. So this would uh, this would be the the highest burden um, for the injured worker. This would be the mental mental case because um, we're dealing with the mental stimulus um, and then ultimately um, a, a psychological injury. Um, so I, if you recall what I discussed before, there's two um, essential situations where the mental mental case could uh, arise or occur. The first would be some type of a, a acute incident where you can pinpoint um, some type of psychological trauma. That wouldn't be the case here. It would be the abnormal uh, working conditions. Um, so in this scenario, the, the nurse would have to show that there are abnormal working conditions over a period of time that cause this stress and anxiety. Um, the argument on the nurse's side um, would be, you know, there's an increased amount of deaths, um, uh, working, you know, much, I don't wanna say harder, but longer hours, uh, maybe a different work schedule than they were accustomed to before um, due to COVID-19. Um, and if, if you recall back in <clears throat> March of 2020 and in, in April and, um, when, when COVID first started, um, you know, you used to see videos and pictures of, of uh, people in, in hallways um, all over, that they basically put up COVID wards all over the place. Um, and many nurses were required to do more than what was typically asked um, of them prior to COVID. Um, I think the, the argument definitely from, from our side would be, you know, nurses their profession is one that, you know, assumes you, you have to deal with death, um, pretty stressful environments on a regular basis, um, and quite frankly, chaotic, especially if you're a trauma nurse or an ER nurse. Um, yeah, I think it's important to note that the courts have typically held that abnormal working conditions involve very traumatic situations. Um, like I said before, being robbed at gunpoint, um, being sexually harassed, things of that nature. Um, and again, this is a pretty high burden uh, standard for 
um, this nurse. Um, that being said, I'm sure anyone that deals with, with Pennsylvania cases and claims know uh, a number of judges tend to be very liberal with their interpretation of the Workers' Compensation Act. Uh, and, and there may be uh, some, some sympathy from the judges in, in this type of fact pattern. Um, but again, it's going to come down to the, the specifics of the case, and it's going to be a, um, a, a fact-intensive analysis regarding whether or not this would be compensable. I, I think you're exactly right, Tom. I mean, the, in Pennsylvania, these cases are always uh, fact-specific. Uh, I would certainly agree that you know, a situation where uh, a healthcare worker, maybe not limited to, to a hospital, but a uh, nursing home, uh, any sort of healthcare environment, uh, part of the training is how to deal with those that are ill, how to deal with death how, you know, and, and, and the like. Um, I would also rely on, on the, the medical opinions from the doctor. If this is nothing more than burnout because of work, not necessarily something that rises to the level of, of anxiety or PTSD, uh, that in and of itself, I would argue, isn't an abnormal working condition. So I think that, you know, while the there is a perhaps a, a a tendency to lean toward an abnormal working condition in this fact pattern, I think we would have a lot of uh, uh, arguments, a uh, number of arguments against the the claim for uh, Pennsylvania workers' compensation benefits anyway, uh, because I don't know that they that this fact pattern would necessarily meet the, the, the burden of proof for an abnormal working condition. Um, Steve, what about uh, Maryland? I would agree with you uh, regarding Maryland as well. Uh, we have to remember in Maryland, we don't have this abnormal working condition standard. So I think it would be much more difficult in Pennsylvania to get benefits, but we don't have much guidance. This is purely a mental mental case in Maryland. Uh, I would tend to agree that based upon her work objectively, this is a person who's taught to deal with death, et cetera, et cetera. If we have a medical opinion that uh, this is simply burnout and, and not anxiety and or PTSD as a result of added work, added work or stress from work, I think that objectively we could argue uh, the claim is not a work injury. So uh, this is definitely, I'll tell you something else about Maryland. Everything's very squishy in Maryland. I, I, I like to call it the wild west. Is that a legal uh, term, Steve? In Maryland, it is today. Squishy. It is today. Uh, the, I can cite Finders versus Keepers, the seminal case. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, I would tell you that unfortunately, in Maryland, when we're going to a hearing, we don't have the discovery like we have in Pennsylvania. So, in Pennsylvania, you can find out at that first hearing when you take the claimant's testimony. Have you had mental issues in the past? I mean, most judges will allow all that's going to be fair game because we have a mental case. You're not going to get that in Maryland. You know, there's going to be a determined, you could go to a hearing that's going to last for 20 minutes. And at that point, a decision is going to be made whether or not it's work related. And unless I know who she has treated with in the past, I'm not going to be able to subpoena any of that information. There's no discovery. I can't simply write to claimant's counsel and say, turn over everything you've got. It just doesn't work that way. So it's much more difficult. So I would say in a case like this, it's definitely deny, 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 get an IME, and we would take that to a decision. Is that, is that really the, the course of action in Maryland, see by the sounds of it? Because you don't have you know, the ongoing discovery, as you mentioned, and, and, and I, the ability to effectively cross-examine. Yeah, I would say, yes, yes, it is. I mean, you don't have that ability to cross-examine ahead of time. I mean, it, it, it's, it's much more difficult when we're dealing with even you know, physical injuries. Uh, you know, don't necessarily know whether or not this person has a long list of injuries and is treated for back their back, for example, in the past. Uh, I think it just, as a defendant, we're hamstrung in Maryland when it comes to hearings. We just are. Uh, but anyway, from this purely mental, mental aspect, I would say they're going to have a very difficult time approving it as arising out of the course and scope of their employment. I mean, it arises objectively uh, to this anxiety or PTSD. So yeah, that's one I would definitely defend. Is that is this any different than in Washington D.C. compared to the it, other jurisdictions? It is actually it is D D.C. is very interesting, and this is something I didn't bring up. I forgot to bring up when we were first talking about it. Same thing, doing a deep dive. There is actually a PTSD case. I don't like reading, but I'm going to read for a second here. There is actually a PTSD case on the books, 
the standard is not objective in DC. It is actually subjective. So the PTSD case, there's a Johnson versus what was the Johnson case. And the fact pattern is this, employer informs claimant and five coworkers that their positions are gonna be eliminated as a result of reorganization. The court of appeals held that the question is whether in fact claimant's termination caused her to suffer from PTSD, not whether termination from employment would normally cause that condition. So the fact pattern that we have that we're, we're dealing with here if she can prove that she actually has anxiety or PTSD as a result of the added duties and the seeing more death, I think in the district, she's got a cognizable case because it is a subjective. It's not whether or not other nurses would get PTSD. The question is whether or not she, she got PTSD. That, that's interesting because in Pennsylvania, there were a few cases um, from PACE and Pace seems to, or seem, not doesn't seem, Pace suggests that the abnormal working condition standard is really in the eyes of the beholder, so to speak, uh, somewhat similar to, to Washington, D.C. Yeah, I think we have a much harder time in Washington uh, winning that case because A, the presumption that says it's work-related, and secondly, this subjective standard. But, but nonetheless, you would, you would still would recommend to deny and, <laughs> oh, yeah. and employ the, the, you know, the defense. Absolutely. So doctor, I have a, another fact pattern for you. Uh, a grocery store clerk is assaulted by a customer after confronting the customer about mask use and later experiences PTSD. Slightly different fact pattern than uh, the, the nurse, uh, but how would you uh, approach that case if it were to come to you? Well, again, I, I think getting the individual in or as soon as, as possible for an IME would be critical because we would want to implement an assessment procedure that's much more than just an interview, right? I just don't want to talk to them about, uh, you know, how this employee is, is doing, what symptoms are they experiencing. I want to put them through objective, scientifically valid psychological testing so I can verify, is this a legitimate presentation or not? Um, then I, of course, would also want to see, well, what are the factors influencing? Let's assume that this individual is experiencing anxiety, fears of returning to work, these kinds of things. Well, what, um, you know, where is that coming from? Is that due to pre-existing vulnerabilities? Is it because there, there are additional stressors in the home? Is it because they are dealing with um, other kind of non-injury related factors? And, you know, what are the influencing variables? And oftentimes, invariably there are quite significant, especially when we see um, amplified emotional reactions, there are often significant other variables that are really the fuel to that amplification. And then providing recommendations. If, if let's say, you know, all the stars are aligned that this is work related, there is an amplified anxiety reaction. I wouldn't go as far as saying PTSD simply because PTSD is much rarer than it is diagnosed. Again, trauma does not equal PTSD, and it's quite a sophisticated um, and, and complex uh, psychiatric disorder that is, is severe and, and considerably impairing. And so I, I would uh, think that this person, if they have legitimate anxiety associated with this, well, let's get them into evidence-based intervention. I see a lot of claims like this, and particularly bus operators. It happens, uh, it, it's, it's quite unfortunate because being a bus operator is a, a difficult job especially in the midst of society that is experiencing all these stressors coming from so many different uh, angles. And so I have seen numerous bus operators who have been um, spit on, who have been assaulted, who have had liquid thrown at them because they've asked patrons to put on their mask out of concerns related to COVID. And uh, time and time again, when I see the individual, the, the treatment is, is really the same. You gotta get back to work. And uh, that is, it's called exposure therapy. Sometimes systematic desensitization intervention where there's a slower exposure to getting back to the essential job functions can be of benefit, but we're talking 45, 60 days of intervention to resuming normal duties. So in terms of long-term impairment or there being you know, any kind of long-term disability, the only factors in these kinds of cases, unless COVID-19 has been contracted and that 0.001 where there's some neurocognitive deficits, things of that, that, that nature, which is very, very rare. I haven't come across a case like that as of yet. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the likelihood of this being any kind of long-term injury is very, very low. 
And more often than not, uh, it, you know, we usually weed these kinds of claims out uh, because the majority of the time, especially with uh, bodily fluid exposures being assaulted at work, there is a degree of simulated impairment that is well beyond the threshold uh, to scientifically substantiate. Or put another way, these kinds of cases tend to either be very short-term needs for psychological intervention or tend to be those that are malingering. So Tom, in Pennsylvania, uh, what standard would apply to this grocery store clerk who was assaulted while trying to enforce, uh, enforce mask wearing at the grocery store? So this, uh, uh, this scenario is actually interesting because I think there's, there's essentially two facets to it. Um, as far as the mental side, the standard would be uh, the physical mental standard. Um, but initially, so we're dealing with an assault by a customer. I, I think we would have to deal with first, you know, was there a physical injury as well? Um, that actually causes some disability. If that's the case, then I think there's some liability there and some exposure on the, the physical side itself, dealing with the, the mental, um, side of it. As I noted before, it's, it's important to, uh, note that. Um, the incident, the physical assault doesn't actually have to result in an, any disability. Um, so even if there's no wage loss as a result of that physical assault, the worker would have to prove that the physical stimulus uh, resulted in some type of psychological condition. Um, what would I do if uh, I'm taking this case, well, piggybacking off what the doctor said, I wanna see every you know, past medical uh, record for this individual, has he ever treated for any, you know, psychological issues before? Um, I want to question him and, and cross-examine him or her uh, regarding any issues outside of work, uh, marriage issues, um, any prior trauma, anything like that. <clears throat> Potentially, you might want to get some some type of surveillance. Um, I'm assuming that this individual would say, you know, I, I don't enjoy anything that I used to. I can't go outside. I can't go for walks. Uh, and then you might see the individual, you know, walking outside every day, signing up for a fight club. So I think it's important to, uh, to, to find out really what's going on uh, behind the scenes uh, with this individual. But they would have to, the clerk would have to present some type of unequivocal medical evidence, um, as the doctor stated, that there's, you know, you've been diagnosed with PTSD and that it is directly related um, to that assault that occurred. Yeah, I agree with you, Tom. I think there's really you know, two components. You have the physical component, uh, because I, I think physically it would be difficult to argue that there wasn't an incident, at least not necessarily an injury, but an incident. If the, right. the clerk is at the grocery store on the clock and is punched in the face by, you know, by a patron, how, how do you not prove that or disprove that there wasn't you know, some sort of of uh, contusion or, or something to that effect. But I think that the, you know, the, the uh, PTSD that allegedly develops after the fact is a separate issue. I, if, if I were a claimant's attorney, you know, I, I would certainly argue, and I would imagine the claimant's medical expert would do the same, that you know, it, it, it's not, it, it's not uh, foreseeable that a, a grocery store clerk would go to work expecting to confront somebody uh, uh, regarding mask use, uh, at least 14 months ago, it wasn't conceivable. Maybe it is now. Uh, and and uh, having been assaulted, developed PTSD. I, I think if I was the claimant's bar, I would make that exact argument that you know, this isn't something that is that is really uh, you know expected in in you know, the the grocery store environment. And just uh, to Steve, piggyback on that for a second, rather, and I know many people probably recall that. Um, th this was actually an issue um, back in March and April when it was really uh, rampant. And I think what employers started doing was actually getting some security guards in there as opposed to, you know, some 17 year old uh, uh, kid trying to, to calm down uh, people for mask wearing. So this is a pretty, you know, it was a real world scenario, I think, uh, and still continues to be at this point. I, I, yeah, I, I agree. It still does. I was uh, at a grocery store over the weekend and there was a, a security person standing at the entrance of the grocery store, uh, making sure that everybody had had a mask on. Uh, and if they didn't, they had disposable masks available for, you know, for, the, uh, for the patrons. Uh, Steve, what about Maryland? How would you uh, uh, 
attack this this physical mental claim. Yeah, I, I, I would agree it would be considered a physical mental claim under Maryland law. Let's deal with the assault first. The assault is definitely going to be compensable, uh, whether you're assaulted by a third party in Maryland or it's a co-worker. So that, that might change under PA law because uh, there's a personal animus defense. But under Maryland law, they don't care. Uh, so I had a case where <laughs> two co-employees were fighting over a dishwasher. You know, one employee pulled out a knife, stabbed the other employee multiple times. It was compensable. So the assault by the third party is definitely compensable under Maryland law. But I think, again, we'd have to still objectively show that the PTSD was a result of that, uh, of that assault. But it is, it is more akin to the I'm helping remove the desk. I get the depression as a result of the, the pain. I think we're still dealing with that type of case under the Maryland law. I still would, same thing, I think we'd have a more difficult time. I, I, I agree with Tom, you'd wanna know exactly what is going on in this person's life. So again, if we could find that out ahead of time, that would be wonderful. If not, I would still try to defend it on the, the case that objectively, it's not a result uh, of the workplace assault. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Steve, with respect to Pennsylvania. If the facts were slightly different, wherein the argument didn't arise from mask use, but perhaps uh, you know, a lifestyle argument or you know, an argument over, uh, you know, over something unrelated to the work injury, uh, that that would be a, an affirmative defense that we would raise in Pennsylvania to remove even, even the physical components of the claim and then by, by derivative, the, the mental component of the claim. Uh, how, how, is, how would you address this fact pattern in Washington, D.C.? Uh, and in D.C., it is good. The, the assault itself is, is the same thing. It's going to be compensable, whether it's a third party. Coworker might be a little bit different. Let's just we'll stay with the facts. We'll stay with the facts. It's a third party, uh, a customer that comes and assaults them. That is going to be compensable, the, the assault itself. And then again, we're dealing with this presumption and a subjective test. So if subjectively, they got the PTSD as a result of this assault, it's going to be compensable. Uh, but I still would not change. I would still, when, whenever we're dealing with things like mental injuries, I would still probably file the appropriate forms, deny the mental I issue, uh, and take that to a hearing. So it sounds like this might be when we're, we're all in agreement where you parse, you, you parse the, out the physical component from the, you know, the psychiatric component, and, and uh, depending on the specific facts, uh, attack the, um, you know, both components separately. Uh, next scenario, uh, an airport employee contracts COVID-19 at work and is subsequently diagnosed with depression after having long-term effects of COVID. So you, you have a, an airport employee who becomes a, a COVID long hauler. So doctor, why don't you start again, please? You know, I mean, I think that this is much more rare than, than, uh, than what, what a lot of folks think, but uh, and I don't know the exact statistics on it, but if we have the facts of where COVID was contracted in, in the performance of essential job functions and there are long-term uh, post-COVID related effects tend to be neurocognitive in nature, um, you know, maintaining an appropriate intervention is really critical and uh, really, uh, you know, where there, you can buffer uh, not what you can't do, it's really to try to prevent the disability mindset, but integrating an intervention of really focusing on what you can do. And so I, this seems to be, uh, the, you know, physical as, as the primary factor in, in subsequent neuropsychological or psychological uh, symptoms. And, and so this is one of those cases in, in, in which I, I would think the intervention would be uh, critical and it could be quite diverse from uh, neurocognitive restructuring, neurological rehab, uh, certainly cognitive behavioral therapy, but again, keeping the individual at work focused on what they can do, providing the requisite accommodations and having regular follow-ups to assess the validity of, of really what's going on with this employee would, would be critical. Uh, I, I'm just going to comment, I, I think a little bit uh, from the legal perspective, because I think it applies uh, to all jurisdictions, you know, fr from my perspective, the, the first question that I would raise or the first line of questioning is, well, how does the employee know with certainty that the employee contracted COVID at work? Now, certainly, if, if they can establish that their coworker in the fueling truck had kept COVID and they weren't masked, and, and as a result of that, maybe they, they, they meet that burden. But, you know, the, the other side, I think, is, 
there's a stronger argument too for any case where an employee is alleging a COVID uh, exposure, you know, the, the questions really are along the lines of, you know, what has been your activity outside of work uh, during these last 14 months? Uh, do you have co um, family members that are working in higher risk environments? Are you masked when you're, when you're in public? Do you have family members that have been diagnosed with COVID uh, and things along those lines? Because I think, you know, one of the things that, that I've seen is it, it, it's easy to say that they, that an employee contracted COVID at work, but actually removing those obstacles and proving that it, it was work-related. I've had very, very few cases where, where there hasn't been you know, a, a viable or a really good defense to a COVID uh, exposure. I think too that, that these, these other exigent factors of anxiety and, and, and uh, mental health issues, uh, unless um, there's an unfortunate death or a long-term exposure, um, at least from my perspective, I, don't, I haven't seen a, a huge explosion in COVID-related workers' compensation litigation because you have a few factors. One, for the most part, hopefully people are, uh, are uh, returning to work relatively quickly. Uh, small employers have to comply with the federal mandated paid leave benefits for certain COVID qualifications. Uh, and then you have employees that, that might actually be earning more through the, the state workers' compensation programs as well as the federal subsidy that uh, we're seeing now. So in some situations, the, you know, the employee is, is, is better off, so to speak, by, you know, by pursuing that venue. Uh, and, and for the claimant's bar, if the potential recovery absent huge amounts of medical bills or, or a, you know, a long-term wage loss, uh, and or uh, you know, a, a death claim, it's not necessarily in the, you know, in the uh, claimant's bar's best interest or, or use of time to pursue smaller claims. But when you can, as a claimant's attorney, I think try to argue other uh, extenuating circumstances in the mental health environment, uh, that's one way to, to really, from their perspective, I think, try to increase the value of a claim. Uh, but with that being said, Tom, how would you uh, address this claim in Pennsylvania? I, Rob, I 100% agree with, uh, quite frankly, your entire analysis. Um, and that's how it would go under Pennsylvania. I think the first hurdle for uh, this individual would actually be, you know, pinpointing that, hey, I contracted this actually from work. Um, and unless you have, uh, you know, some, some specific individual that you can point to, hey, I got it here or there, I think it's going to be pretty difficult um, to actually state that, you know, it was from work. Let's say, assuming they're able uh, to meet that initial burden <clears throat> and show that they got it at work, um, then you'd also need to present unequivocal medical evidence that now you're suffering from depression as a direct result of having that COVID. Um, it's, I think it's, this is the physical mental standard again, if they're able to um, actually present a viable case. I think it's pretty difficult uh, in this scenario because if I'm, you know, from my perspective, I'm going to argue that, I mean, a lot of people are suffering from, um, you know, depression and other issues as a result of, of COVID in general, not necessarily from contracting it. Um, again, I'm going to, you know, request all the medical records and, and, and see if there's any other issues. But I think this, even though it's a physical mental standard, I think this is a pretty uphill battle. And it's, I think it would be difficult for, an individual to um, prevail on this type of case in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, I think the, the, I agree, Tom, that the, the distinguishing factor is connecting the dots for the COVID exposure at work to even uh, overcome that first hurdle of showing that there was a work-related injury in Pennsylvania. Uh, Steve, what about Maryland? How would you- uh, I was just gonna say, I'm gonna, bundle, I'm gonna go ahead and bundle the jurisdictions at this point, because I agree with you. The, the first, hurdle is the, the, the highest hurdle. In fact, I think it's a pole vault in this case, not just a hurdle. You need to be able to prove in both Maryland and DC that the COVID was related to the, to the employment. So if we assume for a moment that you are able to prove that, then I think in both jurisdictions, it's probably the depression is then probably going to be found to be work-related. Again, you'd have to prove that the depression is related to the, the, the COVID and we can argue that, but I think it would be compensable under Maryland. It would certainly be compensable under DC with that subjective standard. But I think the way you attack any case like this, 
is to attack that first hurdle, which is the is COVID related to work. Great. Uh, so we have uh, one remaining fact pattern in, in about five or 10 minutes uh, to allow some time for any questions that, that uh, might arise. Uh, so doctor, uh, I'll read you the last fact pattern. Uh, a well-known pizza restaurant employee develops PTSD after being berated by customers because they were the only takeout restaurant open due to a COVID spike. Uh, I, is there anything different in your analysis or your approach uh, to treatments of, of, of this claim and allegations? I mean, right off the bat, I mean, my, my, my first thoughts are, you know, well, you can, anyone can say they have PTSD, whether they have it or not is, is a totally other question, different question. And, and so the validity of the symptoms that they're experiencing is, is highly suspect, particularly when you're in a service oriented position as well. I mean, I would highlight this kind of a, a part of the essential job functions um, to to uh, be able to adapt to to those kind of customer service uh, scenarios, uh, I, I mean, the, and, and then of course I think particularly related to it being applied in in, in like today's society with uh, with COVID issues, you, you know, what else is going on in this individual's life? What are the other external variables impacting adjustment? And uh, really, where is the motivation behind the, the claim? You, you know, is it because they are just looking and seeking for additional compensation? Is it because they don't want to work and want to pursue other matters? I would we look particularly into other areas of functioning. You know, how's their relationship going? Are they in college? How's their academic performance? And I would look for all these other additional uh, corroborating behaviors to support that, uh, you know, there really isn't any psychological or, or behavioral impairments. But ultimately, no, I think that, that, you know, assessing the validity of the claim is going to be step number one. And, uh, you know, to me, it, it seems very difficult to, to note that just because you're, you're working an extra amount because of, I mean, that seems like the nature of the business. And so it's, it doesn't seem to be a psychological matter. Would it be a bit at all relevant? We didn't discuss this beforehand, doctor, but it just came to my mind. Uh, this this employee would presumably have a, a have a similar spike in earnings by oh, delivering yeah. more, you know, uh, more pizzas, so to speak, or, or meals. So, I mean, would that would you have any discussion about you know the the other components of of the job when you're evaluating this individual? Oh. 100%. And, and so, you know, a lot of physicians, for example, they, they spend 15 minutes in an evaluation, but uh, psychologists, you know, we're like 60 to 90 minute interviews. And then that's then, then you got to do the additional testing and such. It is a full operation of, of assessing the overall function of an individual. And very, of course, I would, I would kind of point that out. I would even be very meticulous in noting their response to, to my questions about uh, you know, that positive aspect as well. But in, in these kinds of situations, and oftentimes it, it is these, it, you know, a lot of times claimants don't realize, you know, when I'm asking, uh, you know, tell me about, you know, about your relationship. How has this impacted your relationship or how are things going with your significant other? And uh, they will often provide very positive <laughs> uh, notes of, of, oh, we're going on vacation. You know, things are going great. You know, parenting is going great. All, the, all these things uh, going into the education history, you know, oftentimes particular positions like, uh, you know, like a pizza delivery driver, for example, you, you know, they tend to be in, in school, it's a part-time job, or, you know, whatever it may be. But, you know, how are you doing academically? How are things going in, in, in that regard? And, and identifying that oftentimes there is this dis disability or almost a predatory mindset uh, from, from an individual saying, you know what, let me put this in just because I'm a little overwhelmed. Uh, that, uh, you know, this is, I, I should be compensated. There's, there's a degree of entitlement and arrogance in that. And it's really important to assess where that's coming from. Is this a pre-existing factor? Is it really completely being embellished? And this is why it's critical to scientifically explore that. Uh, so thank you, doctor. So Tom, we're, we're, we're nearing the end of our time. So if you could briefly uh, identify the appropriate uh, standard or burden for this claim and, and, uh, just again, summarize how you might uh, approach this claim, if at all differently from, from the other fact patterns. Sure, I'll keep it brief. I'm denying it. <laughs> uh, this is the mental <laughs> mental standard. I think the, I think the individual is going to be very hard pressed to, uh, to one, prove that this is an abnormal working condition. Essentially, it's just, you know, you're, it's, it's, a, it's a, a time when you have to work a little harder. 
Um, and I think, you know, dealing with, with angry customers is something that you typically have to deal with uh, at a restaurant. Um, working harder at different occasions is something you also have to deal with. But to try to, I think, you know, piggybacking off the doctor, to try to uh, relate PTSD to that scenario, it's going to be pretty hard to, to present some medical evidence for that. So I'm 100% denying this. <laughs> I think that's sound advice. Uh, Steve, how about uh, Maryland and, and DC? Just to, I will combine uh, the two out. again. Deny, deny, deny. I think you're gonna have a much harder time in Maryland because we have an objective, allegedly an objective standard there. And I think even in DC, trying to tie these two things together, this, this increased workload and being yelled at by customers that then resulted in PTSD. While there may be a subjective standard, I think I think there we have to rely on the medical evidence. You know, you, they would need to presume, you know, present some sort of objective medical evidence that it's related. I deny it. Deny both of them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know in, in this case that that being berated by customers uh, is, is any different than than pre-pandemic uh, beration. If the pizza was thirty-five minutes um, past the hour as opposed to thirty minutes, and and it was cold, um, I, I, I might certainly make that argument that. You know that, that there's no abnormal working condition in this situation. Uh, I, with that, I would like to thank the panelists. Uh, thank you all for your time and, and your effort today. Uh, if there are any questions uh, from the, the audience, we'll uh, just wait a moment or two for uh, the, the Q&A function. Uh, but thank you all for joining.